Mm-hmm. What's your complaint? All right, well, we're a minute early, but um, in a sparse crowd, we have Albert here with me, and then we have Mother Barbara and Rana. Good evening to you. Hope everything's going well. It's a nice hot day today. Busy day. How are you, Mother? I'm doing well. How was your little trip? Did you, was it enjoyable? Oh, it was great. Thank you for asking. A lot of interesting things happening. And uh, one of the most inspiring things is this, this one young kid um, talking to the international, to the astronauts on the International Space Station. Um, it's pretty cool. It's a little complicated and probably a little bit much for today's class, but um, it's just very inspiring to see young kids that, interested in things like that well he had to be so excited it was pretty remarkable i mean she's she, that young lady's actually studying right now to be an astronaut she's already been through some of the training like how to handle flight in uh, high g's and low g's uh, weightlessness and the launch issues and she's actually try, gonna um, do a test simulation in a pressurized suit in Poland, they have the school to teach kids this kind of thing. So, all well, very interesting. It's nice that she has those opportunities. How old a kid? I'm going to guess she's probably in her high school years now, but she actually, there are three levels of licensing now for amateur radio. By the time she was eight, she had all three. Oh, my gosh. Just to put it into perspective, by the time I was 58, I have all three. It's a little bit different. So here we are. All right. Well, why don't we start with a little prayer and then um, we can ask questions or whatever it is you want to do. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. All right. Any other questions? Anyone keep up with the reading so far? Chronicles? Yes. Okay. Anything there? Um, interestingly, uh, you had Chronicles listed with chapters that were actually moving into Ezra. So I uh -oh. think it must have been a, a little mistake. But we finished Chronicles today. Uh-huh. Yes. So that was good. It is good. With, with all those kings. Oh, my goodness. Yep. Yeah, it's it's interesting how all of that works, that there's a, a slight parallelism between the book of, the, well, in the Septuagint, we call it the books of the kingdoms and chronicles. Um, I don't know um, if you've done any study in those areas, maybe you have, but, um, you know, Ezra, chronicles, they all are... Um, emphatic about the worship in the temple are they not but it's not yes. the original temple it's the new temple it's like that renewal that was coming on the return from the exile not right. the um not the exile itself as you hear in isaiah or things like that but it's once they come back because that that's an interesting history that happens there um as we get closer and closer to the time of christ you know, you have um, the Babylonians, they've, you know, overrun and they take the um, 
I would say they take the aristocracy. They take the kings, the rulers, the, the families, the rich families, and they force them to go to Babylon. They don't make everyone go to Babylon. And that actually is what causes so much heartache when they come back. Because the people yep. who stayed there didn't have the same um, religious. I mean, they, they, that's partly why you get things like the Samaritans. Because they're not in exile, but they're still worshiping God, but they're not offering temple sacrifices because they can't. So what are they doing? Well, they're doing the synagogue thing. They're um, studying the scriptures. They're learning. They're applying the scriptural teachings with rabbinical thought, and they're they're living their lives. Am Aretz, the people of the land. And those people were there while everyone else was singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Mm -hmm. And then they come back. And the people who come back want to pick up where they left off. That actually in Chronicles, they haven't gone yet to Babylon. Uh-huh. Because it ends with um, what is his name? Josiah. Yes. The kid that becomes king. And doesn't it start actually in Ezra where um they're in Babylon? Yes. And then they are given the permission to leave. Right. But nowhere really do they talk about being that I could find uh -huh. um being deported. Right. That comes um, usually through the prophetic literature rather than uh -huh. the historical documents. But um, even the um, the telling of the tales in Chronicles, even though it doesn't speak of the deportation or any of the exiles, any of that, it's believed that that's when Chronicles was written. OK, so you have you have kings or kingdoms and um, that sort of ramps up the split between the two kingdoms and, you know, the ultimate um, doom that will befall them both because of foreign invaders. But um, Chronicles tell us the same story in a sense, um, but then um, it goes back into um, it, it's it's sort of paired with Ezra and Nehemiah not mm -hmm. seen as a compliment well i mean it is sort of complementary to this to the books and kingdoms are they not mentioned in the chronicles there's always a reference that you have in there but anyway so that's a um it 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 shows the strife and you know we need to think about the strife that led them to exile in the first place we don't get that so much i mean it, I can just meander here for a second, but if you look at the way that the kings are described, you have kings that are doing what is good in the sight of the Lord, and you have kings that are doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And a lot of times, the ones that are doing evil in the sight of the Lord are the ones that are actually helping Israel to prosper and stay out of wars with their their neighbors. Um, yeah, it's true. And it, it is interesting that that's that's how it plays. And I mean, when you when you push it too hard and I don't recommend doing that, but when you push it too hard, you just realize the whole Old Testament um, and forgive the banality here. Yes, you can derive an entire way of life out of it, but it really does permanently establish just how desperately we need God. Um, and in the Christian context, you can see how everything leads up to the culmination of the Messiah. Um, you have to be gentle with that um, because I'm, I'm not comfortable with um, people saying that, that um, Judaism is inadequate. Um, we are nobody's judge in, in that regard. And I certainly don't approve of the idea of, you know, Jews being blamed for the death of Jesus. Um, you know, we need to be very clear on this, that Jesus came to die. He didn't come to just be a nice guy and give teachings and heal people. He, he came with one specific duty in mind. He had to die because that was the only way that our deaths could be overcome. So to blame the Jews for Jesus's death 
sort of throws out the whole idea of the necessity of Jesus dying in order for us to be saved, brought out of death. Anyway. No, that's a really, that's a very good point. Well, and it's, it's one, it, it, you know, as we were going through Holy Week, you know, I can, I can certainly understand why Father Bogdan wrote what he wrote. Um, for those who don't know, he wrote a, um, an article in the St. Vladimir's Quarterly about our, oh no, it was during the Word magazine that he wrote it. Um, and, and it basically was talking about the anti-Semitic writings within the hymns of um of our holy week you know every other verse in one of the um songs that we sing i think in the middle but the law giving jews failed to understand but here oh jews i mean it's it's all um that's a very it's very strong and and it's it's not necessary it's it's not necessary that it be so strong in my opinion, it, it and when you have hymns like that, it gives people an excuse to do harmful things to people. When in reality, you know, Christ says, or Paul says, in Christ there is no man, no female, no slave, no free, no Greek, no Jew. So, yes, these are things for us to keep in mind as we, um, you know. As we live out our faith in the world, we we live it out with the understanding that for us, the key is humility, always, and not judgment. We're not here to judge others. We're here to live out the reality of Christ's resurrection. We are to live out um, loving our neighbor as best as we possibly can with all our energy focused on, on doing what we can for them when they are in need. I mean, these are, this is what we're called to do. Not not condemn anybody. Even you know, I'm reading the Gospel of John in our our uh, daily readings right now, and he's really clear. Even then, he said, "I didn't come to judge anybody." Right. Jesus says this. If he didn't come to judge, what are we doing? All right. So, other questions about anything, or comments, or anything? I'm open for any questions. Albert, do you have anything? How about you, Rana? No, no questions this time. I have to say I've fallen a little behind on the reading, so maybe that's why I don't have anything this time. Oh, that's okay. It's confusing a little bit to me. Okay. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. Mm -hmm. So Christ human or Christ divine? trampled down death by death. All right, when he descended into Hades, he was Christ God. So why did he have to die in the first place? I mean, I, I, I you know, thought about that for a long, long time. Well, I, I, I mean, as far as the devil was concerned, mm -hmm. as far maybe for us to understand that he was willing to die humanly mm -hmm. for our death is important. Mm -hmm. But as far as the devil was concerned, it wasn't it wasn't necessary for the human person to die, was it? Well, God can't die. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. So God could have Jesus God could have just went down to Hades and obliterated everything. Sure, he could, but he didn't. Why? Okay, so there are. Well, there's a hymn that we sing in probably Holy Saturday. I say it every Sunday, but it's um, in the grave with the body. Uh, yes. In Hades with the soul is God, as God. In paradise with the thief. And in heaven with the Father and the Spirit. Okay. Was thou, O Christ, thyself uncircumscribed? Okay, now that's part one. <laughs> what do we understand about the nature of Jesus Christ? Which nature? Well, there's only one nature. Two natures, one person. Okay. Okay, yeah, that's right. In divinity, he is one in nature with the Father and the Spirit. Okay, all right. 
All right. Okay. Yeah. But he is also because we believe in his 100% divinity and 100% humanity, then he is also fully human at the same, at time. The same time. So you're right. It's two natures mm -hmm. in one person. Saint Sophroni calls that that hypostatic union, hypostasis being right. the idea of personhood. Right. Okay, the hypostatic union. So when he's on the cross, is God on the cross? Yes. When he's in Hades. Yeah. All of them's in Hades, okay. isn't he? Oh, okay. But he's everywhere present. He's everywhere present. Okay. But it gets even more confusing when he ascends to heaven because he's already there. He's already there. And he's already and then he's ascending. So body yes. and so it it's this is one of those things that I don't think we'll ever understand. Yeah, I don't I've I've thought about it for a long time. Yeah. Never asked. Him. But that's uh so why is it necessary? I think it's necessary to show a parallelism between him and Adam. Christ is the second Adam. There are all sorts of references and parallelisms. Yes, and that I you can never see. knew quite why. Okay. I mean, Christ. Because he is Christ a new creation. He died for us voluntarily. Right. Adam surely did. No. Right. <laughs> no, but Adam also couldn't save himself. He had the potential to. Okay, so. That's right, too. He had the potential so to. Adam couldn't save himself. Right. So how's the parallel between Adam and Jesus? Because they're first creations. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, okay. Christ is the first creation. Fully God and fully human. She gives birth painlessly, the mother well, of God. In that sense, he wasn't the first. Well, the first creation immaculately. I mean, not immaculately, but... Without seed. The only yes. creation, the only creation without seed. Yes. But he's also, I mean, as the second Adam, he has characteristics. Even though he is human, he's more like Adam pre-fall than he is Adam post pre-fall. All right. Okay. However, even there, I mean, you can't push it too hard because there are logical in inconsistencies that immediately pop up. He still bled. Would Adam have bled if he had been Not cut when he was in Garden of Eden? Maybe he would have, but well, he would have healed immediately. Well, um, we don't know. Because as soon as Eve appears on the scene, sorry, as soon as Eve appears on the scene, so does the serpent. Okay, there's there's no interim where Adam stumbles, falls, scrapes his knee and gets healed immediately or anything like that. So going back to the to the issue, why did he have to die? I would say there are several reasons for that. Just to destroy that. I, I said I understand why, what it means to me. Uh -huh. The agape love he had. Right. Uh, that That's important. Well, remember, that's it's a two-step process, though. Okay? The first step is he's got to eliminate the need for all their sacrifices. Because he is the sacrifice without blemish. And by virtue of being the sacrifice without blemish, he makes all other forms of sacrifice irrelevant. So null and without void. that, Eucharist would not be. The Eucharist is the only the thing that remains. That's the only form so of sacrifice death, that there remains. Would be not, there would be no need for Eucharist. No, there wouldn't. All right. Because you'd still be doing the sacrifice. Right. Yes. Well, no. No. No, we wouldn't. No. But that's that's where it goes. Right. Okay. So you've got to remember it's a two-step process. And I actually talk about this in one of my videos this week. So you have um, the question always comes up. And I, I'm going to do this as a, in the form of a test. Okay, so actually, let's just do it now. All of us can answer the questions, but one at a time. And you can say it, and then um, don't argue against someone else. If they say something different, just let them say it. Okay, so the question is, are we born in sin and therefore we die? Or are we born in the, the future death and therefore we sin? Okay. Mm. 
Can you say that one more time, please? Okay. In the, when we are born, are we born in sin and therefore we die? Mm -hmm. Or are we born dying and therefore we sin? The first one for me. Okay. Albert, you said the second one, right? Albert says the second one. Anyone else want to vote? Come on, Ronnie, say, you have to vote. <laughs> I was going to say the first one because okay. I know that there's in a prayer <laughs> or maybe it's a psalm, in sin did my mother bear me. Yeah, that's so Psalm 50. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm going to pick the first one. Okay. That's true. That was before Jesus. Okay, so the Orthodox perspective is that Adam and Eve, although they sinned, they brought death into the world. Okay? Mm -hmm. They brought death and corruption into the world. Sin is a response out of our fear, our existential fear of death and mortality. See, I buy that sometimes. So essentially what you're saying is if we were immortal, then we wouldn't sin, or at least have as big a propensity to sin. Well, we have free will, so we would. We still would. Yeah, we would. But then think about the mother of God. You know, the mother of God never sinned. Okay. Well, did she know she was going to die? I don't know. Being the mother of God. Well, I got a fax. So, Debbie, here's a question for you. Oh, All right. So, are we born in sin and therefore we deserve to die? Or are we born dying and therefore we sin? No. We're born in sin and therefore. Okay. Three of you are Catholic. Ah. <laughs> See, that's well, number one. In yeah. the original sin. As far as we're concerned, so but when you get your communion, though, I mean, baptism, uh huh, all that sin is washed away, right? Who has sinned? Oh, no, I, no, oh, yes. you're, no, the baby hasn't sinned, that's right. But the, the, we have been born into a sinful world, so right? You explain to me whether it was you or somebody else. It was like what? we're born pure and then thrown into a mud puddle, <laughs> and therefore we get dirty. Yeah, because the the world is dirty. You can we we argue that the mother of God never sinned, okay? Even though she you know would tell him to come out of the synagogue and behave himself, she never sinned. Because we see that as just her motherly instincts taking over from her understanding of exactly who it is that she gave birth to. All right, so why I'm bringing this up is the logical progression is we are born into death. And therefore, we sin as a result to being born into death, all right? Because God is hard to see. We see through the mirror dimly. We begin to think that we have to take matters into our own hands. We begin to think <clears throat> that we can control things. We can control our lives. We can control other people's lives. We can do things that are deviations from what God would have us do, okay? And so that's sin, I mean, sin is doing things that are contrary to what God would want us to do. Pretty simple. So what does Jesus do? On the cross, he wipes clean the sin so that we can return to the first nature, but it hasn't resolved the problem. He wipes clean the sin. No longer do we have to worry about sin. As long as we cleave ourselves to Christ, we no longer have to worry about sin. And so the sacrificial offerings that were made in virtue of sin, you know, all the holocausts and everything else that were given, those things now are rendered needless because Jesus sacrificed his perfect self once and for all for all of that. Okay, but that just puts us into the condition where sin is no longer a concern. But there is still one more concern. We're still going to die. So... Not only does he have to wipe clean the sin, but then he has to journey into Hades, take all the people that are out of there and raise himself up and then promise that we too shall be raised in the last day. Those who have died along with us will rise in the clouds and greet him there and go to heaven. Okay, so 
it's a it's an exact reversal of what happens in Genesis. In Genesis, you have death or corruption first, and then sin. And then in Christ's sacrifice, you have the sacrifice that wipes clean the sin. And then you have his rising from the dead, which destroys the stain of death. I'm stuck. I'm okay. stuck on the first part. Because right. the way Adam and Eve, is my understanding, the way Adam and Eve were created, they were created without sin. I mean, they were created in the fullness of what humanity was, and it was out of their own moving against their own nature that they sinned and brought all this stuff into the world. Okay. Is that not right? Well, it it is and it isn't, okay? They were born into the potential to do everything, okay? Not sinless. Okay. I mean, they were just like our babies are born sinless, but the potential for sin is there, even though right. they're immortal. Okay. And the potential right. not to sin is there. I'm going to talk about that in a second. I think, <clears throat> um, I think this is all um, very interesting. So you have um, in Adam and Eve, you have free will. Okay, that's an important characteristic for us to hold on to. We have free will. We have the choice to say yes and the choice to say no. So we um, are tempted then, Adam and Eve are tempted by the devil through the, you know, the serpent. And they do exactly what God told them not to do. Okay. Now, it's not... It, what we're what we're stuck in is this cause and effect loop okay so we look at it and we say well because they sinned this is the effect of it all right and now it's because we sin this is the effect of it all right it's not that way it's be, their eyes were opened immediately upon eating the fruit and they perceived that they were naked that's a very important thing Okay, that perception is very important because it shows a an existential change in them. Actually, an essential change in them. They change, their, their beings change. They go from being able to see God clearly in the Garden of Eden, to hear his voice, to watch him walking through the garden, to recognizing their own physical shortcomings and having to do something to fix those physical shortcomings. And so God, God says these are the things that are going to happen, but the reality of it is they were going to happen whether God said it was going to happen or not. He says, I will multiply pain, I will make it difficult for you to till the soil and so on. But the reality of it is it was already happening. He was just telling them what happened. Because they saw each other's nakedness. They sewed fig leaves and stuff to protect their their virtue and all of that. That's that's a sign it's 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 the how do i put this it's just the change of their being they go from being perfect as perfect as they could be but perfect in terms of raw potential not in terms of actualized anything do you know what i mean by that they all have the possibility of being what they are but they didn't live into it because they Almost immediately upon walking on earth, they did exactly what God told them not to do. And notice, as the story goes anyway, Cain and Abel pretty much do exactly the same thing. Right. It's just a continuation of the same problem. And Cain has exactly the same problem as his mom and dad. He refuses to own up to his own responsibility. Instead of accepting the fact that his sacrifice was illegitimate and going and doing better, he kills his brother so that there's no competition. God has to accept the sacrifice, except he doesn't. All right, so go back to Adam and Eve. They make the mistake, but the, the reality of it is from that point on, they are in a situation where their bodies corrupt, their, their bones break, they need... Um, they need to eat. They need to be careful of carnivores. 
they need to dress up warmly because the winters can be harsh or they need to um, consider how to change things because the summers are also really harsh. And there's no guarantee that the crops that they plant mm -hmm. will be crops that will grow in a season and provide fruit for them. So they're completely having to depend on their own physical senses to be successful. When God was their chief source of care, they didn't need any of those things. They just had things provided for them. The fruit was always there. They could always take of it. And so could lions and bears and tigers. All of them were vegetarians at that point until the fall. And then all of a sudden, lions looked at lambs and said, oh, you look really tasty. And lo and behold, they were. All right. So that's um, the reality of it is that because they change, then they go into this thing. And, and you know, was Cain born in sin? No, but his choice to make an offering that was lackadaisical was a sin. And certainly his choice to kill his brother rather than fix his own bad practices was a sin. And so he, he fled. He went into the land where God is not, the land of Nod. Can you go back for a minute to sure. Proposition 1? based on everything you've just said okay. and discount it for me. Discount what? That it's not, that it's it has a, a Catholic understanding to it and not an Orthodox okay. one. Okay, so in Catholicism, <laughs> they have a really difficult time explaining why the resurrection is necessary. Okay. Because what really matters is Christ dying on the cross to satisfy the demand of justice that God has because we are sinners. And the only way that that can be overcome is if someone dies for us. So it's the concept of the scapegoat. We should ask okay. what you're saying then. You ask a Roman Catholic, why did Christ die? Uh huh. To atone for our sins. Yeah, it's, it's because. Why? So if you ask an Orthodox person. Mm -hmm. To trample down death. Yes. But not nothing about the sins? Well, that's what I was saying. I mean, the sin is a prior condition. Well, that's part of the condition. Okay. Uh, yes. But like I said, I mean, sin is, yes. I mean, we, we talk about sin a lot. You know, Psalm 51, remember, is Old Testament. That's true. And, you know, right. they're going to have that whole image of, in sins did my mother bear me. But it is possible to live and never sin it is possible is it probable no but it's possible and so we can understand that that there are human beings that have come very close people that we know have come very close <clears throat> to not sinning Who did you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh come on one of your beloved old aunts maybe I don't know. Too feisty. They were too feisty. So, um, so that it for me it 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 where it all falls apart is in infant state. You know, remember in Catholicism, up until Vatican II, and even after a little bit of Vatican II. You could not have a funeral for a baby that wasn't baptized. And they could not be buried in a Catholic cemetery. You go to the cemeteries around like in Johnstown Way or places like that that have old and established cemeteries. There's a ring around the cemetery where babies used to be buried because they couldn't be buried in the cemetery. There's one out there. Two. Two. Yeah. I found one. Oh, you found one. No, there are two. Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't want that publicly disseminated. I didn't know there was two. I have to look. Right. So, I mean, what would we think about that? No, of course, if a baby's dying, what are we going to do? We're going to baptize it. Okay, but that's not to save it from eternal damnation. That's just to bring it into the fold. St. Gregory of Nice is kind of clear. He says that infants don't, they don't go to hell. Infants that die prematurely go to heaven, period.
so it's it's a it's a reflexive property. If you put the mirror in the center, A is death, B is sin. In Christ, B is his death on the cross, destroying sin for all. And then A is destroying death and returning us to the prior condition that we had before we fell. So it's A, B, B, A, logically. Does it make sense? Yes, but it leaves me swimming. I mean, I, I, I have no trouble with with the concept or belief that resurrection is probably the most important part. Uh -huh. Okay, um, I have no trouble with that, but I do have some difficulty back in the beginning where it was their free will that made them sin, but they weren't they weren't living in sin at the at the time that they were created they had the potential to to sin but they right. weren't sinning at that right. point <clears throat> okay so let's look at it from a couple of angles first adam and eve they have the potential for everything okay but they mm -hmm. only know what they know they are raw potential just as we are but they had the potential to be eternal. All they had to do is keep his commandments. They immediately failed to keep his commandments and they lost that. And then you, took a, you take a look at the mother of God or John the Baptist, somebody like that. We talked about John last week where his body is still here with us, but we we would assume that he is because of his singular focus on being the forerunner for Christ. We see him in a position where he is equal to the mother of God on the other side of the throne of Christ, his mother on one side and John on the other. And so there's a good potential that John didn't sin either. Now, we don't know if Adam and Eve sinned after their first transgression. All we know is they gave birth to two kids, Eve did, and then a third one, Seth, later on, after Abel died. So that's all we know. And then they die, and then they die. Abel dies first, then they die next, and, and they are in Hades until Christ comes and sets them free. But the sin with that, you really have to just look at Leviticus and understand what's necessary to restore the relationship between us and God. And a lot of times it's some form of offering. It's a sin offering, it's an it's an Ola or a Holocaust, it's complete consumed offering. It's a peace offering. It's a wellness offering. And there are all sorts of different sacrifices that are made. And what Christ does is he destroys the need for those things to happen. He tears the curtain and the temple in two. And he also makes it unnecessary for those kinds of sacrifices to ever have to happen again. And so there's only one sacrifice that remains at that point, And that's the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Okay, so what we are doing is we are just saying thank you. Okay, nothing else. Now, someone could say, yes, Father, but we do talk about receiving communion and having sins forgiven. What is that supposed to mean? You say it every time. Yeah, lo, this has touched your lips. It shall take away your sins and cleanse you from your sins. No, when you give, when, when, when you distribute the communion. For the remission of sins. For the remission of sins. For lasting, right. So what is that? And there are lots of prayers that talk about um, asking forgiveness for sins that are past, even though you've confessed them, and we believe that they are forgiven at the time of confession. Yeah. And so that gets complicated too. It's the same piece of the same thing. Well, I need to see those prayers, honestly, um, because that's 
that's kind of a big no-no. Okay, I'll be glad to show you because it's one that I say every day. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'd like to look at that. But um, so what are we saying? Well, the answer there is, what are you receiving at that point? You're receiving the body and blood of Christ, right? Right. Okay. Where does that phrase come from that I said, Lo, this is touch your lips, you should purge away your iniquities and cleanse you from your sins. Where does that come from? It's Isaiah. Yeah, it's Isaiah. When Isaiah is anointed by God to speak his message to his people, he's in heaven in this presence. And he's like, woe is me, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips and here I am. I'm going to be destroyed. And an angel takes a coal from the, the, the censer and touches his lips with the coal and it burns away his sins. Okay. Is that where purgatory came from? Well, that's what communion is, isn't it? Well, is it? Receiving, okay. receiving Christ. All right. If you're discerning Christ in what you are receiving, it's burning away the sins. It's purging you from your sins. You have to live into it. You have to recognize it. You have to not trivialize it. That brings up another issue, but we can talk about that in a minute. So communion is the, the act of wiping clean your transgressions, presenting you as a clean person ready to be in the presence of God because God is in you. Nothing that is impure can stand before God. It will be burned away. All right. Nothing that is so impure for, can so stand for that one God. moment, for that one moment, we're pure until we think right. or do something that right. screws it up. Just like when we come out of the waters of baptism. Right. Same thing. Yep. Or even when the stole's put on your head at confession, same thing. Because mm -hmm. that's what absolution is all about. That's why if someone says, well, Father, I want a, 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 a confession in advance because I'm going to Vegas. <laughs> I say, I can't help you because I cannot forgive what has not been done, nor can I forgive what is intentionally being done and will be done again. Some people, you know, it's... <laughs> I actually know no one here has told me that somebody in my past church actually my brother no nah, no nah, he's never done that no I promise he's never done that so sin is an overlay it is not our condition it is something that that is like a veneer on us that can come off it is entirely possible that you can go to a confession have it come from your heart and then from that moment on for the rest of your days never sin again it's entirely possible and i would gently argue maybe you should live like that yeah <laughs> Right. I have a question about that, yeah. Father. So, and you never have um, I feel like if you, you know, had your confession and you were absolved of your sins, and right. then you went on to not sin, but just the fact of you acknowledging the fact that you didn't sin, would that be a sin? Boy, is that a confusing one, huh? That's a good one. Yeah, you always have to be careful of pride. Okay. Always. And so when you begin to think, oh boy, am I awesome because I haven't sinned? Yes, you can't, you can't do that. Okay. Because that's just another journey down a bad road. Um, you just take the mind of the publican. You know, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Always doing that. Okay. Keep the spirit of humility. Um that I think is an appropriate response. A non dis I think some of our responses are disproportionate. Um and I and I blame a certain strain of, of Athenite theology where they really want to emphasize the fact that we're all horrible sinners and don't deserve any good thing that God has to give us. Um 
I'm not going to get into an elaborate criticism, but I am going to say that I'm not sure that that's where we all need to find ourselves. We should harbor no illusions that we are only saved through the grace of God. Okay. And that's an important thing for us to hold on to. But at the same time, if we are trying to do what we can to do our best, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to love God as much as we possibly can, to show no preferential treatment even towards someone, like because, you know, this is blood, I'm going to treat them better than I treat someone who's not blood. And I know that's a little bit controversial, but it, I mean, that's the message of Christ. When we're baptized, we come out of the waters as a new family. The blood is gone. The blood ties are over. And what is new family then is the church. Do we live into that? No. Do we harbor these romantic notions of family? Yes, we do, to our detriment. But we can come out of those things, communion, baptism, confession. We can come out of those and never sin again. It's entirely possible. Is it probable? No. But is it possible? Yes. Okay. But not when you dwell on it. <laughs> But not when you dwell. Well, no, even when you dwell on it, I mean, basically what you would do is just continue to, when you have, look, the devil's always going to put thoughts in your head. It's always going to give you those temptations. And I didn't want to stop. I'm gonna, I want to bring that up again. But the temptations will always come. But temptations themselves are not a sin. Right? Just to act. You acting on them, and there are two ways to act. There's one where you just sort of obsess about it psychologically or mentally, and then physically you act on it. Those two things are sins, but the other is not because temptations come all the time. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest temptations is the belief that my sins can't possibly be forgiven because they're so horrible. There's no way that I could possibly be mm -hmm. forgiven just by confessing them in the presence of God no way okay and that that is a problem to me a big one because i think it's completely wrong i know it sounds easy and we don't want it to sound easy but you know what it is easy because there's nothing you can do to save yourself so what are you going to do to save yourself you're going to put yourself at the mercy of christ and that's it and live in thanksgiving and live in thanksgiving that's right. It's interesting because that beautiful part of the liturgy that says, you know, we we praise you, we bless you, we worship you, we give thanks to you for your great glory. I mean, yep. I looked up all those words this week because oh. they just kind of slide off, you know, like yeah, what's sure. the difference between glorifying and giving thanks? And mm -hmm. they're, they're really just our attempt to say the same thing. There aren't discrete differences between right. thanksgiving and glorifying right but, but what a message that that you know just kind of slides slides through my mind and it's really so incredibly profound hmm. because the the great ascetics you know you read all these stories about um people that appeared very holy and their disciples saw them to be holy. And on their deathbed, they were lamenting the fact that they had not yet begun to repent of their sins. Right. And the reality is that that's probably true, but they weren't reflecting on themselves. They were reflecting on God. Right. So it's, it's complicated, but not complicated. Right. And, and it, it still drives home for me, the point that humility is the key. Yes. You know, humility and Thanksgiving. That's right. Yes. And that's why, you know, the term orthodoxy for me has nothing to do with us being right and everybody else being wrong. It has to do with us knowing how to pray in spirit and in truth and how we can do that par excellence because we are inheritors of this beautiful tradition of worship in the orthodox church it's what we do best how many orthodox ethicists do you know i know a couple but that's not our priority our priority is worshiping god in spirit and in truth so that's where i think we need to begin and end 
a humble Thanksgiving, but a Thanksgiving nonetheless. You know, it's we don't need to give God a ticker tape parade. Although <laughs> it's probably better than giving ourselves a ticker tape parade. Do they even do that anymore? Is ticker tape a thing? Whatever parades they have to celebrate. But we can um we can always have on our mouths on our lips, a simple thank you to God for everything that he's done for us. And between that and living a life of humility, a gentle love, there's, there's, in my opinion, there's nothing better. So you would ask something. I don't think I addressed your question, Debbie. What did you okay. ask? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so again, from an Orthodox perspective, it isn't we 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 do sin, but the sin is not prior. You know, it it it's not in Catholicism and in, in, in it's actually more dramatically emphasized in um, Calvinism where God is a judge and the devil is the prosecuting attorney. Jesus is the defense attorney and this, the accusation is that we have done actions that are worthy of death from the moment we were born to now because we were born in utter sin and unless we have allowed ourselves the grace of baptism to wipe clean that sin then we will die in that sin and even after our baptism if we continue to sin then all we're doing while that's happening is we are um, cheapening our baptisms so again, we still deserve to die. It's the only way that we can be saved from that death is Christ's taking us and becoming our sin, becoming the one who suffers because of our sin. He is the scapegoat, the blemishless sacrifice. A scapegoat was an animal that the townspeople would bring into their midst every year and they would lay their hands on the animal and they would declare their sins publicly. And then they would drive the animal out into the wilderness to be devoured by the wild beasts as a symbol of their sins being devoured by the devil or however you want to put it. So Christ becomes the scapegoat for us he takes on our sin. He becomes our sin. He sends the cross. He dies. And the sin is wiped clean. And the death sentence that was thrown against us is, is, is vacated. No more death sentence because he died for us. He died so that we don't have to. Okay. And then what about the resurrection? Well, um, that's handled in a number of different ways. One of the more interesting ones, in my opinion, is the Father looks at what Jesus did, sees that he accomplished everything that needed to be done, and because he did, raises him up. Oh, that's, probably, that's probably the most realistic of all of them. What's that, Mother? Nothing. Okay. It's, yeah. I just found that a little startling, that's all. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I made someone jump this morning. Doing technically, stuff like that. the Father raised them up, not the Holy Spirit. Right. Technically, the Father raised them up, not the Holy Spirit. But also remember, they have a confusion of terms. Who does? The Catholics. They can't really describe the persons of the I Trinity do. to the same degree that we that we do. We fall into the danger in orthodoxy of maybe spending too much time talking about the individuals of the Holy Trinity. The Father has this thing, and the Son does this thing, and the Holy Spirit does another thing, um, which can be seen as tritheism if you push it too hard. Tritheism meaning worshiping three gods. See, 
and the prayer we say for the sick, the one I use. Them. Okay. Holy Father, physician of our souls and bodies, who mm -hmm. has sent thine only begotten Son, our Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, uh -huh. to heal all our ailments and deliver us, deliver us from us death. death. Mm -hmm. Do thou to visit and heal thy servants, blah, 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 blah. Right. Blah. So it's Jesus healing in this case. Okay. Not the Holy Spirit. No. So what did the Holy Spirit... I mean the Father. What's What's the Holy Spirit get credit for? <laughs> <laughs> send down thy spirit upon these gifts here spread forth and make okay, this bread so the precious that, body yes. of thy Christ and that which is right, in the like cup the precious blood of thy Christ the sign of the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit okay your baptism yeah and but it lives in after that he's off the hook. takes up its abode no it helps direct you and guide you and merge you with the rest of the church and so it's the Holy that. Spirit that does that sure right. yeah but, you know, then again, St. Gregory Nazianzus says, when you think of the Father, you can't help but think but of the think Son of and the son Spirit. And the Spirt. Spirt. When you think of the Son, right. you can't help but think of the Father exactly. and the Spirit. When you think of the Spirit, you can't help think of the Father and the Son. So you cannot think of one without the others. And just to make it even more interesting, that prayer that you say, you say for your um, intercessory prayers, when I'm at the bedside of somebody, I say, oh, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, the heavenly physician of our souls and bodies. I so see you call Christ the heavenly physician. Yeah, because he is. He's the one who heals on earth. Okay. okay. That's it could be, oh Holy Spirit, the heavenly physician of our souls and bodies. It could okay. be all of them. In that regard, all it right. can be that all of makes them. Makes sense. Okay. But when I make those prayers, you know, the ones that are in our service book, which dreadfully need to be rewritten. Boy, do they need to be rewritten. Um, but it's very clear that those prayers are to Christ because then you have um, God who is from everlasting and then all who give the life being spirit now and ever and ever ages of ages. Amen. So yeah, it's it's complicated. But they're all healers. Aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, yeah, I buy that. Then also it clicks over here. Then why do you need all three? You don't, you don't need all three, but you've got all three. Okay. It's not up to you to decide what you need and what you don't need. That's, that's true. Okay. And for, uh, and for us, the way that we can understand it is biblically, you have a manifestation of father, son, and Holy spirit. All you have to do is look at the gospel of St. John and well, all yeah, three are there everywhere. And obviously it, it is the uh, And it's the Ophany, and then at the uh, very end of the gospel of Matthew when he tells you how to baptize. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's that. That's, it's that's in true. Paul too, but you have to look harder. And he does talk about Jesus being raised by the Father a lot. Paul does. You know, probably have noticed that. Yep. I'm going to pay attention. Right. So um, I think we're totally sidetracked now, but does anyone have any questions or comments or anything else I can clarify? I don't think that was sidetracked. I thought it was really helpful. Oh, good. I hope it was. Thank you. I do have one question, Father. This is Please. something I thought about on Sunday during the gospel reading. Okay. So the women go to the tomb to yes. anoint Jesus. Right. Um, how were they going to anoint the body if the stone was in place? Like, how was that going to work for them? They were going to bribe the guards somehow. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is something that I think is understated and should probably be more stated than it is. I don't know what Father Chris said. I didn't listen to the service. But um, I would say every figure that we remember last Sunday. So that's um, the myrrh bearing women, but also Joseph and Nicodemus. Um, all of them are excessively brave. And mm -hmm. I mean, like super brave. Okay. For a new, a number of reasons for the men, they run the risk of losing their positions in the public because they're supporting a known criminal. Okay. Even to the Roman authorities at this point, because he was 
because he was killed, he is seen as an enemy of, of Caesar. Okay, so he runs the risk, even though what Pilate said, Pilate yeah, said. He said he wasn't. He but it says the king of the Jews the across the top of the sign. And I'm not talking about what Pilate feels. I'm talking about what the rank and file feel. So the Roman soldiers would have put that up. What, that sign? This is the, the king, king of the, the Jews? Jews? It was there in what Greek there? and Latin and Hebrew. Now, certainly some of the centurions say this was an innocent man and all of that. But, I mean, by that time, by the time he's in the grave, he's just a dead criminal. And so to have Joseph and Nicodemus do what they did is pretty remarkable. But then the myrrh bearers, even more so because they're women. And, you know, they're going to care for the man that they loved and cared for very deeply. And so going to the tomb with the aloes and the spices and everything else, they were going to at least be harassed by the guard that was there. Probably more than harassed. We don't need to go into details, but you kind of guess where I'm going with that. They were probably putting themselves in a very bad, vulnerable position. And yet they still did it. They didn't even think about it. They just went and they did it because it was the right thing to do. Because they loved him. They weren't expecting anything in return. Joseph and Nicodemus weren't expecting mm -hmm. anything in return. They didn't know he was going to rise from the dead. They had no clue. They heard what he said, but I mean, there's one thing about hearing what someone says, and it's a totally other thing to have it really happen. And so when it did happen, how wonderful it is that they're the ones that saw him because their faith was rewarded. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I just don't think we make enough of that. We really should say more about that and recognize that it's the women that Jesus you know, was resurrected before first. His manifestations were to the women first. And that's because they are the brave ones while the disciples are off cowering away in the upper room, afraid of persecution. They didn't care. They're going to go take care of Jesus. That's pretty awesome. And it was even harder because he was already in, he was already bound. I mean, right. they were going to have to take off all those wrappings to be able to anoint him. Yep, that's right. In fact, we brought it up in, in, in class that day that there are people, obviously, that have said all that stuff was made up. Uh huh. But if it was made up, they would have never had women getting credit for the, being the first at the resurrection. That's right. So that's that, and that's interesting too. Yep. They would have said the men get credit, Peter. Whatever. Yep. That's a very interesting point. And that's actually mm -hmm. something that can be taken, not just with this particular instance, but with, you know, even though St. Paul has admonitions of against women teaching in the church and things like that, he does talk about men and women being treated equally. Okay. No male, no female, no slave, nor free, no Greek, nor Jew, you know, to return to that. But even beyond that, then you go into the early church and you have um, deaconesses and you have um, women being treated equally with men. You have Tabitha and her she's such a great asset to the church and how horrible it was that she died. And so they bring her back from the dead. And I mean, all these different examples um, you do not see that anywhere, anywhere else in in like religious studies of anything. I mean, sure, you've got Ruth and you've got Judith and you've got um, Esther in the Old Testament. Um, but you you don't have the same, especially the same communal respect for an entire you know, gender and the entire, all of the women, not just some women, but all the women were treated that way with respect and dignity. It's one of the reasons why the church grew. It's, it's humility, it's selflessness, it's unwillingness to put someone beneath someone else. We got over that pretty quick, but we, we'd started that way anyway. Yeah. I read there was a deaconess ordained last week in Kenya. Maybe. She wore, I saw a picture. She wore deacon's vestments. Maybe so. I don't have a problem. 
No, I mean they serve they serve particular functionary roles. Well, it did say, you know, like you had said before, mm-hmm. during women's baptism. Yes, you know, situations like that, which made totally sense. You know, we don't we don't strip women down and their men down to their skivvies and make them get baptized. We don't do that. But in Kenya, they probably do. In Kenya, they probably do. And so it's not appropriate for men to be helping women come out of the water. The bishop that ordained her was white. Okay. I mean, he was probably from Europe. One of, maybe probably Russian, I would think. Oh, I don't think so. No. I would guess Greek. Mm-hmm. Yep. Hmm. Well, I mean, these are open questions. Right now, we're sort of in a phase where we have to make sure we're towing every line. But I, I think that'll change over the next generation. Um, right now, um, and I know this is going to, if, if people hear this, it's not going to be judged very, very well. But I think we're in a cycle of neo athenite orthodoxy. And I mean, I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but I don't think it's all of orthodoxy. Um, and so what would I suggest in return? Well, studying Sergei Bogolkov, I don't think is a bad thing. Um, listening to Tom Hopko is certainly not a bad thing. Um, you know, they're, they're Orthodox is a world religion. And that means that you've got people from all over the place. Um, so yeah. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, God bless you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll meet next week. Okay. You take care and I'll see you soon. Thanks, Father.